Welcome, friends. This is Adrian Sinclair with a podcast with interesting people. And today we're going to be talking about ketamine and suicide and PTSD, uh, super important topics. And I want to open up with reading uh, these statistics. In 2017, there were 47,000 recorded suicides, up from 42,000 in 2014. And this is according to the CDC's National Center for Health Statistics. And it increased uh, by 24% in the United States. The, su the suicide rate increased 24% between 1999 and 2014. The World Health Organization estimates that uh, every 40 seconds there is a person who takes their own life and they predict that in 2020 this is going to increase to a person taking their own life every 20 seconds. And so I want to introduce today our guest, Dr. Robert Heimstra, who is an expert in, in ketamine treatments. And this is one of the things that we're going to be talking about. And with us today is also Mike Blasey, who is my co-host. And we are going to be talking about what can be done about PTSD, what can be done about depression, what kind of um, tools are available right now. And Dr. Heimstra is going to tell us uh, all about it. Thank you for being on the show, Dr. Heimstra. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we've met at a at a ketamine fund uh, a luncheon, which was organized by Zappi and Warren, who who are starting this uh, ketaminefund.org, which is sponsoring ketamine treatments for PTSD for veterans with PTSD. Can you uh, just tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, um, it's a fund that Warren and Zappi got going with the help of the benefactor in the last six months they've been working on it for at least a year or so and uh, they're doing great things gathering the money for supplying uh, the money for the free treatment of vets and we're greatly enjoying implementing the program yeah it's it's such a worthwhile program to um to sponsor uh, some of these treatments um uh, and we talk we're going to talk about ketamine specifically and and you know what is it why does it work? How does it work? And, and the history of it. And that's why we're super glad to have you here today with us. And um, why, don't, why don't we start with what ketamine is? Well, it's a synthetic drug created from scratch back in the early 60s. And it was originally created as a, a general anesthetic where we plan to use it to take out your appendix. And it worked very well that way. We've been using it for probably 50 years. It actually, as a general anesthetic, has a few little drawbacks that feed into its usage in other areas where we use it for dental procedures and things like reducing your arm uh, if it's broken. How, like how safe is it? Hmm? How safe is it? You know, uh, ketamine is an extremely safe drug. Uh, physically, it's hard to hurt someone with it. Unlike propofol and Michael's problems with dying with it, right, or it stops Jackson you from breathing, uh, ketamine just ha doesn't have that much in the way of side effects, as we'll possibly get to later. Uh, the most dangerous thing about ketamine, I enjoy saying, is going to the bathroom. And that's because of the fall risk, right? There is a fall risk. fall risk. So it's the problems with drunkenness more than any specific physiologic problems that it has. Right. So it makes you more dizzy. So it makes you more dizzy. So you can you can fall and hurt yourself. Exactly. <laughs> you're on your way to being anesthetized, where you're going to be lying on the slab and part way there. Right. Uh, you can still walk and be treated for depression that you're at risk. So one of the things as I was doing research on ketamine, um, I, I found this, which is uh, giving a little bit more insight of, of what ketamine is. And one of the things that was really striking to me is that it is so safe and so critical that the the World Health Organization, and let me just find this over here right now, it considers uh, this, uh, this uh, compound 
to be uh, the safest and most effective medicines. Uh, so here's here's what it, what it says. Uh, it, World Health Organizations, it's on World Health Organizations list of essential medicines, the safest and most effective medicines needed in a health system. And um, that's an amazing statement. Just uh, it is because it's, it's a globe. We're talking about the whole planet, the whole globe. And that includes their using it in the big doses that it was originally planned for. So for the general anesthesia, plus for the intermediate type stuff, right? It just right. doesn't do much damage and is so very, very useful. Um, it was originally used um, uh, as a general, as a surgical anest anesthetic in Vietnam War due to its safety. And um, so that's its primary, primary use when it was invented. It, and it seems that only in 2000, a, there was a, uh, the antidepressant effects of ketamine were first shown in small studies in 2000 and 2006. A single low uh, sub-anesthetic sub dose of ketamine given via intravenous infusion may produce antidepressant effects within four hours in people with depression. These antidepressant effects may persist for up to several weeks following a single infusion. This is in contrast to con uh, conventional antidepressants like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, also known as SSRIs, and tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, which generally require a last, at least several weeks for, the, uh, for their benefit to occur and become maximal. Why, why is such a delay um, for ketamine to just kind of pop right now in being, being used as um, in help, you know, helping with PTSD and, and, and depression? Well, we just didn't recognize that it worked until Dr. Crystal back at Yale did that work that you're talking about. So they realized probably patients that had their appendix out were suddenly not depressed. They put it together after the 30 or 40 years of its being used and realized that it was effective. Uh, and then once they realized that, they had some other difficulties to get through that they had to worry about. They had to figure out a dose and uh, concern for this emergence phenomena uh, going on. But uh, it just took a, a while to get that together. At the same time, once we realized that it was an antidepressant, and once Big Pharma realized that it was an antidepressant, it uh, was hugely controversial on the inside. Big Pharma doesn't want this drug out there replacing all of those SSRIs that are making them tens of billions a year. So yeah, so. you just you just answered my question, right? So uh, I've been seeing several doctors and I've gone through these, this process of SSRIs, SNRIs, trying to figure out uh, which one works the best and it's the most unscientific process out there. It's basically trial and error. And not one of them has had ketamine. And you know, I have I think I saw my first doctor for, for antidepressant in 2011 and I've never heard anything about ketamine. So um, can you expound on that? Why, why it's like that besides the big pharma? Is there just not the doctors not getting the, the training or not hearing about this? I don't think it's that they're not getting the training. It's that big pharma does not want ketamine out there. And they all know, the doctors and big pharma know that if the SSRIs stop flowing, so does the cash. Mm -hmm. It's Upton Sin Sinclair again. If a man's salary or if a man's acceptance of the truth or realizing the truth depends upon his ignoring his salary, it's not very likely he's going to be looking at the truth. That's a paraphrase. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of money. Uh, at the lower level, but mostly at the big level, at the big pharma level, ketamine's being actively suppressed. So when they found this out, they put up big roadblocks. Mm. One of the first roadblocks, when they recognized that it was effective, but wanted to cut back on it, was to place the rule that you must fail two SSRIs before you're allowed access to ketamine. 
which is kind of ironic because the drugs that are required to fail have never been demonstrated to really work. Yeah, if, on that note, if they yeah. work statistically, yeah. it's minimal. That's that's what I was going to ask. So, it, from what I've heard, the statistics are really good. The success rate of ketamine, and on SSRIs, they're you know magnitude smaller. Do you have any fig, hard numbers that you can compare, like the ketamine versus the traditional uh, antidepressants? Well, um, j- uh, vaguely, uh, with the SSRIs, those are down in the 30 to 40 percent range you know when you get up to a 40 percent uh success rate then you're starting to get close to a sugar pill right anything beyond that 40 percent is probably positive and right in that lower level there's big struggles to demonstrate one or two changes in percentages but ketamine is pretty much universally in the studies that have been done in the 70 to 85 percent category. Wow, that's incredible. So that's not just twice as much. If you go from a sugar pill at 35 to uh, an SSRI at 40, which is being charitable, giving them that percentage, that's 5 percent, right? If you're, which a 5% change there to get to 70 is eight times the effectiveness to get up there. So it's at most one eighth and it's probably more like one fiftieth or one hundredth. So this is in line with, with what I said, did a little bit of homework and, and here's what I found in terms of, um, So uh, based on available preliminary evidence, the magnitude of antidepressant effects of ketamine appears to be more than double that of conventional antidepressants. On the basis of these findings, ketamine has been described as the single most important advance in the treatment of depression in over 50 years. I mean, that's astounding that we're still, you know, clinging on to, um, to tools that are not working when this is still available. And again, when you say twice as effective, that's being very charitable to the SSRIs. It's 40 or 50 times as effective. If those are really working at all, they aren't really working at what we would call depression. In fact, the whole time that they've held sway in the anti-depression world, we haven't known what depression is. You were quoting an article from Nature Magazine there uh, which describes it as the greatest or the most significant advance to psychiatry in the last 50 years. And that same article defined what depression is. That, that was the February 15, 2018 issue of Nature Magazine, where there's an article on ketamine and depression that defines ketamine as the single greatest contribution to psychiatry in the last 50 years. And they, at the same time, they tell you what depression is, where they define the lateral habenula as your brain organ of despair. We've never seen that before. We actually have an anatomic organ defining depression. And the really exciting, strange, surprising part to that is that the lateral habenula is an evolutionarily acquired organ, which means that depression is naturally selected for. It's not just an accident. I was I was at a at the ketamine conference this last September, and one of the doctors gave a presentation where they listed probably 50 different contributors to depression. And they were all different kinds of errors of metabolism. Uh, uh, Different things that we don't want to have happen that we don't consider normal. Mm -hmm. But this lateral habenula going off, this suggests that depression is something that we might want to have at certain times in our evolutionary existence, that it's going to lead to our having more children, et cetera, et cetera. Somehow it will result in a positive outcome. And uh, 
once we've gotten there, we can recognize things like uh, depression follows families, and it's three to one female. Again, these are all things that suggest that it's a natural phenomena that is there because it was uh, called for. Somehow useful evolutionarily? So, yeah. So, uh, thinking about that, uh, I can give you a great explanation that's kind of wild. It's about a 10-minute TED Talk. But basically, <laughs> it asks that question. Uh, if depression is something that's universally negative, as in we don't think as well when we're depressed, our memory isn't as good, we're antisocial, our blood pressure is up, our diabetes is worse, why does the cheerleader want that guy? Well, she doesn't. So how could it be selected for? Where in history did the cheerleader want that guy? Well, there's a meme going around on the internet now. It's, and it's entitled, The Neolithic Y Chromosome Bottleneck. And it's a story of how when we started society at the start of agriculture, when we began, how, um, uh, during agriculture, uh, it started off that grandfather serially raped grandma for 3,000 years. Now, during this time, only 1 in 17 men got to father children. So, what is going on and why? Now, on the internet, they spend a lot of time trying to figure out what is going on here. Why would this happen? I mean, would it be that males just want to have all the females? Is it that simple? Well, that's one suggestion. Certainly, if the king wants to inseminate everyone, right? Are they all Stormy Daniels, right? Uh, he does want to be doing that, probably. We can look at that part of it. It might also be that uh, we have a, a military situation there where it's important that the strong-armed king is doing all of the inseminating. He's going to make the soldiers. Uh, to find the truth of this, I think looking at the story of Moses and the Midianites, where uh, in the Bible. Do you know that story? Well, Moses went to war with the Midianites. It was because they were worshiping Baal. And he decided uh, that uh, it was something that should be done. The generals came back, said that we've won, we've killed all the men, here's all the women. And Moses famously said, well, but a Medianite woman who's been with a Medianite man will be as a mote in the eye, a thorn in the side, kill all the non-virgins. So they did. Now, um, back at the beginning of agriculture, it was essentially that situation where the one thing that was important was that those early societies grow enough food to grow enough people, to make enough farm equipment to grow more food, and to, and to make enough military equipment so that if Moses showed up on the ridge there, they wouldn't be immediately extincted. So think about that situation. When the warrior king comes into his harem once a month, does he bring a rose because she's going to make a soldier? Or does he hope she resists? Well, yes, both of those. But the female, now that's the important one. Grandma lying there waiting for the king. Well, she has just been out on the Serengeti directing evolution for six million years. She ruled out there. If we look at the male chromosome out on the Serengeti, 50% of males didn't get to father children. Why? Because the female has been directing things all the way through. If you were too short, hairy, or stupid, you didn't get in there. 
So how do you tie that back into into depression? And um... so grandma, okay, when she's lying there, okay, waiting for the king to come in, she has just been ruling evolution for six million years. Mm -hmm. All right. Now is she's being asked to father 20 soldiers suddenly. That's what the king is asking her to do. Right. Uh, I don't think she's going to take that after having ruled all this time. So we know from our own Mason Dixon line experience what happens to uppity slaves. They're killed. So grandma's lying there being told that she's going to father these children. If she says no, she's out of there. This is the time for depression to move in and allow her to stay alive, make the 20 children, and then uh, uh, actually cultivate depression. So are you saying that depression in that context would be a self-defense mechanism? I'm saying that it allows her to stay alive. She has 20 kids, all of whom carry this pro-depression uh, gene now. And depression is three to one females. So more females right? suffering. That's kind of, well, that's evidence of this past experience. All the guys are dead. You know, whereas out on the Serengeti, 50% of men didn't get to father children. Here at this early part, only one in 17 gets to father children. Those other 16 out of 17 men are all disappeared. If you look at the graph, it shows these graphs where the females' genes continue normally, whereas there's a huge drop-off in the diversity of male genes. All the men were killed. They were either enslaved or killed, or at least not, not let close to the women. Right. Now, during this time, there's huge evolution going on. You know, when I talked about how the female directed evolution, she took us from chimpanzees up to Cro-Magnon man. You know, huge march forward. And Cro-Magnon man was a stud, big, much bigger than we are, stronger, everything. But he wasn't a citizen. He wasn't ready to vote. During all of this time of of uh, early years of agriculture there's a lot of evolution going on hierarchy money all the different values of society as opposed to a hunter gatherer were all cultivated then okay and you know this is when donald trump was born at this time so this gives us a little bit of a history why do we have this brain structure to to actually have depression to actually have that li lateral habenula programmed in the way that it was right. programmed so now that we have that and a little bit of that understanding how that evolved so that we actually have that organ have that uh, area of the brain which which is responsible for depression and why do we even have depression because it, an honest answer would be why do we have to be depressed? I mean, it makes no sense to be depressed, but that kind of sheds a little bit of a light why and how it progressed because of the our history. And the thing, uh, one thing I didn't mention in that was that the theme of grandma and her depression to recognize is thwarted ambition. That's what happens with with depression. We actually make the choice to be depressed, usually. It's not forced upon us. How so? So this decision is one of looking out and deciding that your future isn't what you want to confront. Grandma there, having to make 20 soldiers as opposed to her wandering the Serengeti, is the example of thwarted ambition that I would talk about. So suddenly she's in jail. That's the ultimate and thwarted ambition. So is there something similar that we can look to now to duplicate that thwarted ambition? Well, I, I think Tom Cruise has some wisdom for us here. He once said, supposedly, I, I haven't been able to duplicate this quote, so I've got to spiff this up eventually. But Tom once said, supposedly, there's only four jobs worth having. President, movie star, sports star, rock star. If you aren't one of those, you don't count. Well, ridiculously elitist, except it's not. 
I would suggest that every kid with a smartphone sitting there watching the lives of the rich and famous while he's swaying to his favorite hip hop dude knows that he's not president, movie star, sports star, rock star, and he's never going to be. I think he's right there with grandma. I think there's thwarted ambition right here. You know, any kid that's born into our culture with the wealth discrepancy and stuff that we have, with the future that's in front of them, with politics blowing up like it is, he sees a tough thing going on. Okay. And I think we could call upon thwarted ambition. So, um, so I see the parallels that, that you drew between the incest, an, ancestral uh, or historical yet evolutionary paradigm where females were subdued and 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 uh, in that type of environment depression naturally developed as a as a defense mechanism and now this is kind of spreading across you know uh, the whole society because they are um, because access of the media access to to um, to the information that feeds them these constant images of what success is and if you are not part of that then you are nobody or you're you're, you're, We're you looking out at the future, and it just doesn't look that bright. Whether it's global warming, right. nuclear war, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, uh, I think it's pretty easy for any modern young mind to see that, gosh, I just don't have the options that right. when I was back in the 60s surfing it up, whole different world back then right right i mean yeah. now it's easy easy to get depressed when people are just watching lives of rich and famous and you got instantaneous access and insight to their lives and the 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 lush of everything lushness of their existence and you compare that and then you're like well um, i guess you know i'm 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 uh, I'm not I'm not successful, and that takes you to on that. We have such an opportunity to mm -hmm. silo ourselves right. into whatever viewpoint we want to, and when we're that siloed, right, if there's no opportunity, no ambition inside our little silos, so and now, no one's going to take us out of the silos. So take us now from from that context to how does ketamine fit into that? Is that the um, is that the solution? Is that you know where where does ketamine fit into this? We have a lot of we have legions of people that are depressed more and more. In fact, I I um I wrote down over here in my notes that according to NIH, the National Institute of Mental Health, major depression is one of the most common mental disorders in the, in the United States right now. And I think these are not the latest numbers, but it seems that an estimated 17.3 million adults in in U.S had at least one major depressive episode, and this number represents 7.1% of all at U.S. adults, and I think it's even higher now because it's trending trending upward. So There's all the kids. I mean, uh, they're going south in ways that we just don't understand. When, the, when a teen comes through my office, I query every one of them about their friends. Uh, trying to give me an estimate of how many of them they think are sick. They aren't professionals, but but you can recognize depression, you know. No one will look you in the eye and they'll only text you and so forth. It, it's a, uh, something that we all recognize. They give me figures like 50 to 90 percent. Wow. If that's true, this is a World War II level of concern. I mean, Right. I, I hate to even admit that it's true, but I think it is. You so, know, I mean, they're they're all sick. So, uh, so what? Where's where does ketamine fit into this? How do we? Well, ketamine, as that article said, it is the most significant contribution to psychiatry in the last fifty years. That essentially says that it works. So, if you go to that article, I will show you exactly what happens. You can see it and see ketamine destroy it. And I think that's actually the best answer. You know, uh, in the article, we get to see the lateral habenular burst mode. That's the signal that the lateral habenula sends out to the brain to tell it to be depressed. Once it establishes that you've experienced enough stress that you should go into depression whatever that formula is that we don't understand. So the lateral habenula reaches that point and it sends out these little signals. They're real simple. There's five or six 
beats that group together, whereas normally it's all a random pulse, suddenly you see five or six group beats, and I know that that rat wants to get out of town. And if I give ketamine, immediately that group beating is gone. So just being able to treat that lateral habenular burst mode abatement is what could probably account for most of ketamine's positive effects. And SSRIs don't even address that. Now it also does dendritic repair. I mean, if you want to look at huge, exciting things that might be the mechanisms of ketamine or additional mechanisms that are wonderful that contribute to this, to the anti-depression, the lateral habenular burst mode may just be depression. Maybe the dendritic repair is just helping our memory and dendrites working better in a general sense. Ketamine does supposedly have longevity benefits. Uh, I'm not sure what longevity benefits mean exactly, but it might mean that dendritic repair. Is this based on some of the research that you've done as, as part of your uh, I guess practice and research? No, that's been mostly reading, you know, like the dendritic repair. We've known about dendritic repair in the hippocampus where most memory is processed for a long time. And we've accepted that that probably accounts for the bad memory of depression, right? Uh, but NPR just came out with an article a few months ago, for instance, that said that they have witnessed two-stage dendritic repair in the stress parts of the brain. They didn't uh, mention what they thought were the stress parts, but it's different from the hippocampus. And the two-stage part, I like they said, first it partially repairs it, and then it goes in and totally replaces it. Well, dendrites are every place. Every neuron connects to a thousand other neurons by way of dendrites. Inside these dendrites are the stuff of memory and thought. To repair that, gosh, that's as fundamental as you get. That's changing the oil on your car. Right. Basically. Right. Dr. Hamster, how did you get into uh, this field? Uh, that's kind of an interesting question. Um, first of all, I wanted to be a psychiatrist all through medical school, but it was such a bogus topic. You know, it's great to study, but the practicality of it, it was all Freudian. They all had these big mustaches and stuff. And it just wasn't the science that other parts of medicine are. So I didn't do it. So it was a soft science and versus then, medical uh, training, which is hard science. Way more. Well, they're given at the same time. They're all a part of medical school. Okay. And I love the psychiatrist giving the lectures. But when I really got down to the prospect of what am I going to be doing with patients and so forth, it's just a, a totally different world. So um, I have followed neuroscience and so forth for a long time, uh, but didn't really plan to be involving myself professionally at all until my best friend, uh, a retired doctor, called me with a Bloomberg article where it, they mentioned that uh, Ketamine is a great antidepressant, and people are lining up outside of psychiatrists and anesthesiologists to get the medicine. So I had used ketamine as an ER doctor before, never for depression, but I used it in the past, knew a little bit about it, uh, and uh, have thought used, it was a great opportunity. Have you used it as an ER doctor in... Uh during emergency, during emergency, I uh, have uh, not as an antidepressant. Uh, right, it was used for. I would as an use it to sew up the kids. Someone. Uh, there's there's a few places where if you have to intubate a patient, meaning put a tube down their throat, uh, that ketamine has special value. It dilates bronchi, so if you're an asthmatic and having problems with it, it can add a little bit. But in general, it's not a real good muscle relaxant, so. We don't like it for that all that much. That's why propofol 
is better as a general anesthetic. So. And once in this field, what did you find out? Once you immerse yourself in, hey, this can be used, ketamine can be used as, as this um, antidepressant or, or, you know, changing. Tell, to tell us a little bit more about, you know, how, how was that process when you were, you know, starting your practice? Right now you are based out of Utah over here in Ketamine SLC. Uh, you're running a clinic over here. Take us through, like, describe a story of, like, how that evolved from the inception of you deciding to want to do that. Okay. Um, I think the most significant part about my evolution there is how I've evolved this intramuscular step system of doing it from the original IV. Now, almost all doctors, certainly in the beginning, give this drug in intravenously. And we do that, I think, mostly because we're conservative guys and that's the way it's always been done. So in the operating room, you always have an IV in place. And if you have an IV in place, you're going to be using it. But outside of the OR, uh, specifically here where we're going to be using it as an antidepressant, we use a much smaller dose approximately one one hundred twentieth of that dose to take out your appendix. So uh, it's a much different scheme. And uh, outside of the ER, we have a different set of concerns. In the ER, where we're giving much higher doses in much larger amounts, much more rapidly, the side effects are much, much worse. And we have to worry about things where having that IV in, pl in place is really important. Outside of the ER, at the much lower doses, the situation changes. Uh, in fact, the IV is more dangerous in and of itself. You have more adverse events with the IV than you do with IM. Now, how many more? I'm really not sure. The insert itself just makes that general statement. So all I have is my own data. Right. And I am is intramuscular. Intramuscular. So it's shot, just a shot in your shot. Yeah, Which shot time? versus right. IV. And when, when I first heard that you were doing the shot versus the IV, I was like, wow, if I want to try this, I'm going to you. I'm not going to these IV places. Because when I first heard about the IVs, I was like, I, I don't want anything to do with that because I hate having IVs put in, you know. So. But why, why is it more, um, you said that IV <clears throat> and going through IV has like, it's worse than, in, than intramuscular. Why, why do you think that is, um, the drawbacks? I, I think, and this is theoretic, well, there's actually three big categories of criticism that I would look at. The first one that we're talking about now is what uh, the pharmacist will look at. What are the adverse events that you get and uh, which one has the most number of them, which one are the most dangerous? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look at that, as I said, from the, from the insert, it just says baldly that that's the difference. So I, I look at my data for that one, and I see that doing it IV, I did 600 cases initially that were done IV, and I had one major adverse event where a 15-year-old girl stopped breathing. Now, it wasn't a big deal. All I had to do was shake her shoulder, and she'd start breathing. But it counts as a major adverse event, so that's one in 600. Since then, I've done 7,500 IM treatments. 7,500? 7,500. 7, 7, wow. And I haven't had any adverse events. And that's with IM? That's IM. Shot in the, in the shoulder. So that suggests a 15 or 21 or, or, or 20 to 1 ratio. If that's true, you probably shouldn't be doing it IV just on this basis. And how now, long? now, I don't really have the figures. I've been trying to get them. Like, I went up to the university to try to get their figures, but they wouldn't give them to me. Really? Right. I know. Kind of interesting. There's a lot of politics. That is in interesting. That. that is interesting. But uh, so, anyway, to march on to the other criticisms, the next one has to do with the emergence reaction. 
you know, sometimes during the process, uh, a patient goes berserk. They have a bad trip. That's the big concern of doctors in determining that initial 1 120th the dose of the take out your appendix dose. The doctors knew basically three things that allowed them to make their decision. First, ketamine works for depression. Second, uh, you can freak out, have a bad trip while you're getting the ketamine. And third, the doctor gets really freaked out if the patient gets freaked out. That's the reason that they selected that dose. So at that dose, um, I've treated uh, 1,800 patients where I started off with that dose. And I've had four people have significantly negative reactions. What were those? Not, not, not dangerous ones. Right. But just where they freaked out. Were they freaked out? Like one of them, the one that I quote that I look at the most, it was an NFL defensive end, more cut than LeBron, who was rolling around in one of my treatment rooms, confused and frightened, going, what's going on here? And uh, if he'd had an IV in place, tell me about the blood. Right. Right? Or if he was at the university where they have hard tile floors, stainless steel gurneys with sharp pointy corners, and all their furniture has sharp ridges on them, and they have patients sitting around on other gurneys. If he'd been rolling around in there, that'd be a motor vehicle accident level of carnage. Well, that situation really spooks doctors. You don't want to have that patient going right. on. Not if you have an IV in place and you aren't ready for it. When he got out of it, um, was he able to describe to you what happened to him? Like, what, what, no, what did he, he freak out? Did he no. even remember? You know, you're asking all the right questions here as I lead up to the consequences of a ketamine bad trip. When I'm talking about what it is to have a bad trip and how horrible it is, right. or whether it's horrible at all, as I'm going to get to, which right. it's not. All right. So let's talk about that for a second. So there's two different kinds of bad trips. One of them is just a panic attack that we all know about and we've all seen. It has to do with breathing too fast and you get tingly fingers and you can pass out. So first of all, the best part about a ketamine bad trip is the 20 minute half-life, which means the longest that your bad trip can last is 10 minutes. So when you have your panic attack, um, yeah, you're breathing too fast and fingers get tingly and numb. As an ER doc, I would see one of those a day. So my instructions are to slow down your breathing, even hold your breath for a count of five or ten while you're doing it, right? And eventually, they'll come back. We have other maneuvers, too. But with ketamine, if I issue that suggestion three times, they're going to listen to me. Not because they're listening to me, but because the 10 minutes are up, right? So the 10 minutes are up, they slow down their breathing, and it's over. So the other kind of panic attack I like to refer to as getting lost in a loop of infinity, where these people get lost in some scenario that they've created and go off to a world that they don't think they're coming back. It's a scary place where they are. Now, you ask where they've gone. They never know because they don't remember. So how horrible can it be if you don't remember it? Right. Secondly, the next day, they'll often say they had the best experience of their life, or they're, they're having the happiest day of their life. Interesting. That happened to my NFL defensive end. So what's going on? I like to think of it as a product of those, you know, there's um, different MRI and different brain scanning devices that look at your thoughts, and they show the density of your thoughts on psilocybin and off. 
and the on one is always very dense. Well, the Buddhists say that the mind is made of 10,000 selves. Uh, and so during this time of increased density of consciousness, maybe those selves come together and they have conversations or arguments that maybe they resolve. <laughs> is that why he had the happiest day of his life? I don't know. But whatever the reason, it's at least an argument for maybe wanting to have a bad trip. So you think it's cathartic in a sense of... It could be healing, totally healing. And if you don't remember it, and if you're happier afterwards, hey. It's almost like, um, you know, when uh, emo emotions spill. It, this, is, this is my, ways, my way of... Uh, really poorly trying to to uh, synthesize what you just said when there's like some kind of a traumatic event and someone is crying and and they they pour out those emotions you feel so good and relaxed afterwards it's almost like you know that bad stuff had to happen in order for your brain to kind of recover and have the good feeling right i mean every every crest has a you know a could trough. be it it's it's it could yeah, be yeah you have one. this giant event right i mean why do you have the happiest day? I mean, that kind of explains it. It explains relief. Right. But the happiest day of your life? Right. Yeah. So those are some, so, so those are some of the negatives that you addressed. How does that stack up to the, what, what ketamine has to offer as, on a positive side? Well, um, as the article said, it's the most significant contribution. And the reason is that huge success rate. Right? And what I is mean, that in, in your practice, in your experience? Um, the, most people quote 70 to 85 percent. The university, if you go up to their clinic, they have it posted on their door. They claim a 60 percent success rate. Now, why isn't theirs 70 to 85? I think it's because they don't increase the dose at all. They always give that 0.5. So it's six 0 0.5 milligram doses. So they do just one, they administer one dose and that's it versus you have multiple doses that you do? How does that? Oh, well, the, the original protocol that the university follows and most people start with is the six doses that promise three months of no depression, no drug levels, no side effects. That's the holy grail of all of depression. That's what everyone wants, right? How far are those doses spaced apart? Well, in the protocol, they're every other day, all right, for the six doses. Uh, but only 40% of people get there, right? 60% of people respond in a different way and will need other kinds of regimens. Uh, and I get into this when I'm talking about getting, you know, uh, developing the whole system, this whole step system of ketamine to maximize the actual dosage there. Where um, if we go through and discuss how they got to the six doses, the original docs, I go through and I discuss how you can't give it all at once how you could give all six doses in three hours, you know, a half an hour apiece. And that could work. The reason that I don't do it is because your brain isn't acclimated yet. And that's part of my job is to acclimate your brain to ketamine. So the next option is once a day. So for six days, you get once a day. And that works great. And I still do that when people fly in from out of town and they don't want to stay in Salt Lake for 12 days. So I give them six, they're gone. People that live here find that too clustered. So they actually want the extra day inserted. That's the only reason it's there. So if we get to that, we give them six doses, and they get three months off, uh, they're really happy, right? And the doctor... Well, the doctor gets the charge six times. Of course, he's happy. But I'm the cheapest ketamine in America for two reasons. One is that $300 price, which is competitive. 
Uh, but I'm going to uh, compress those six doses down to one dose. So I'm effectively one-sixth of that $300 in price. Now, how do I do that? I use those six doses, but only once. So when you first come in, I will use those six. But the step system that I'm talking about steps up during each one of those. In fact, inside of each one it does, because I give two injections with each visit. And each time I increase the dose by 10 milligrams. So I start off with that protocol dose of 0 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. And if your dose was 40, I would drop you down to 30 to be gentle. And on your first day, I'd give you 30 and 40 milligrams. And then I'd let your brain acclimate during the next two days. And you would come in, and I would increase your dose to 50 and 60 and then 70 and 80, and you'd end up in a, an approximate largest dose on your fifth day of 120. So I would construct a booster on the sixth day of three of those 120 milligram doses. So because we've decided that six times your protocol dose, six times 40 equals 240, is your minimal requirement to qualify for the Holy Grail. Now, uh, 3 times 120 is 360 milligrams, so I have plenty more than that 240 to qualify you for the three months. So then I let you go. And for the next stage of treatment, we have to know your interval. Now, if you last for the three months, we're done as far as deciding. I'll give you that same three-legged booster that lasts three months for $300 forever. And that's how you treat a polio epidemic or an epidemic of depression. That's how you treat 80 million people, right? Is, is it that price in that way? So after the three months, it's just a one-time thing. You come in once and you get the, the uh, three legs. Now, only 40% of people will get that three months. You have to have the right brain. And by right brain, what does that mean? by right brain, I mean that you aren't bipolar, OCD, autistic, pain based, or some other definition that we don't recognize yet. Those different brains generate so much stress that uh, you aren't going to last for the three months. Stress is what causes it all. So you might have to come in at one month or two months. Well, yeah. What happens then? Let's talk about that. That's real important. Uh, say you only last one month. Your interval is one month. Well, it's been a great month. You haven't had a month like that ever before in your life probably, right? So you're happy with that, but we can do better. So what I would do first would be to give you another leg. Instead of three 120s, I'd give you four 120s and see if we get an extra week. If we do, I'd go, let's keep going, and I'll give you another leg. So I'll give you five legs trying to get to six weeks. And if we get to six weeks, that's productive. That's something you could live with. You could come in and get that one booster once every six weeks forever, and that's a great trade from your old depression. Right? So now if you only last two weeks, and plenty of OCDs and bipolars or pain-based people are way down at that end, mm -hmm. you're never going to get to the Holy Grail. And what is the Holy Grail? The Holy Ga yeah. Grail is three months mm -hmm. of depression of freedom from depression freedom from drug levels and side effects that's purity right so that's what ketamine can offer so if you're down at two weeks your intervals only two weeks uh we're gonna have to go to ketamine trochees which is a daily treatment schedule so i would give you another booster just like I did because you're depressed and hurting and I want to relieve you from it. But I would also start you on the ketamine trochees. 
And over the next few months, we'd be building up your dose and finding what's going to work for you that way. And that you take either every night or every other night. And uh, essentially forever. So we'd start you off with the low dose one, let you play with it, build it up, uh, and probably end up at two or three hundred milligrams every night or every other night. Is this a pill? Uh, it's a dissolvable lozenge that goes in your cheek. Okay. Right? And at the higher doses, it's very comparable to, to an injection. Okay. So you require chaperones. We won't let you have it unless you have a chaperone at home that can watch you. But those are like ex fewer, but those are like more of those extreme cases in terms no. of where, No. No, that's the bulk of depressed people. Only 40% qualify for the Holy Grail. 60% are going to end up with trochees. I have to ask, what, what, what's so special about the three months? Why, can't, why is it not longer than that? Oh, some people get to seven or eight months. Okay. There's a few. So and it's just your own, it's that whole thing about having the right brain, you so know? Three months the the guys of... at three months don't have the right brain to get to seven is yeah. what I would say. So you know, we don't, we don't of, have the... At the top of the bell curve, right? You got people on either end. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. What kind of patients come to visit you? What kind of, what type who is coming to visit you? I mean, clearly people with depression, but we also talked about, um, we opened up with uh, PTSD, veterans with, with PTSD. What well, are some of the, what are the, some of the successes that you've had and experiences working, wor working with them? I know there are successes because at the meeting, uh, there were several, uh, several uh, uh, um, veterans who had literally stepped away from, uh, from, from suicide through the, um, it's ketamine, what, what sure. saved them? Well, the classic ones that, that we've already been talking about are, is basically depression, and then anxiety can do the same thing. Getting off into other labels, uh, there's some really interesting things going on there. PTSD is kind of unique. We look at that as being a problem where your right brain holds those terror-filled memories and does it in a way that it's kind of eternal, that can float around in your brain and intrude any time it wants. So that one of the big treatments for it has been EMDR, eye movement dissociation and reprogramming, where we recognize that as that right brain lights up with all the activity, it shuts down the left brain. And that's important because the mind's major mechanism for dealing with those memories, if it's ever going to tame them and make that person a regular civilized person again, uh, it's going to have to contain that. And the way it does it is with story. As an English major, I love this. But so uh, this is wrapping that terror with little engine that could, beginning, middle, and end story. So EMDR does it by trying to activate the left part of your brain at the same time that this memory is going on. So it does this by alternate lateralization, one side and the other. So you're retina is already divided into right and left. So once you start going back and forth, you are getting left and right activated there. And the left side has all the story. It has your Broca's area where you manufacture words and do grammar and, and all that speech stuff. So to light it up where it's been shut down specifically before, probably is that mechanism. So you take that terror and you get it so it'll dip over here, get grabbed by story in a few words, and hopefully pretty soon you're a calm person again with a story to tell that doesn't bother you. Is that, is that what's happening in the brain when ketamine is uh, uh, being metabolized? Well, by you? it's one of the interesting things for it. Uh, ketamine also treats that PTSD.
And I've been uh, mixing EMDR with ketamine. I didn't know that anyone else was doing that, but I just saw an advertisement for a podcast where uh, the doctor has been doing that and wants to instruct people how to do it. And I've found pretty significant results for it where people feel they can control the psychedelia. They can kind of direct it as it's going on, and people have gotten successes with their depression that they just hadn't gotten before without the combination of the two. That is very interesting. I'm, I'm familiar yeah. with EMDR based on my conversation with another doctor, Dr. Julie Lopez from D.C., who uh, is, she's working on uh, using EMDR and um, brain spotting and, and other and um, neurofeedback yeah. uh, in, in terms of rewiring your brain. But it's very interesting that you're combining ketamine treatment with that because that is, that's more of a, what uh, psychologists or, or uh, count mental health counselors are using, and that's, that's in their tool belt. But yeah. that's very interesting that you're doing that. One of my favorite patients that way i i gave it to him and he says gosh doc i i can stay away from the colors and i can take it just where i want and i think i found my ptsd i mean who would have thought when i was five years old walking by that car accident that all those body parts would bother me but i guess it did and uh he thought that he had resolved a lot of his PTSD. He was feeling different at the time. Amazing. What happens when uh, when you have a guest come in, uh, guest, a patient come in? Describe what what the process is for someone to get um, admitted to to your clinic to to go through the um, uh, the process. Someone comes in, let's say, with depression or PTSD or um, traumatic experiences, or whatever, whatever the threshold is in order to do this treatment, what happens? Can you take me through, the, you know, paint a story for me, what happens when they visit you? Yeah. Uh, well, we do most of the medical stuff. We uh, will do their vital signs and take a history, and uh, if they've brought in their previous histories, certainly look at them and see what's happened. Uh, So we want to exclude negative medical issues, make sure that the blood pressure is okay and allergies are known. Right, that that was going to be my question. Like, what are some of the, um, you know, who is not a good candidate for for this type of treatment? Is it is like someone who has, you know, heart issues a problem? Like, what is disqualifying someone from from doing a ketamine treatment? Well, there's a list of things, narrow angle glaucoma, if their blood pressure was up, if they had had recent heart problems, anything that would make them especially fragile, I'd be reluctant to get in there. All all those that have to be judged on a case-by-case basis, but if someone was very fragile, especially if it looked like it was susceptible to hemodynamic stuff because there is going to be an increase in blood pressure and all. Uh, I'd be reluctant to. Mm-hmm. If there was any question, I'd be sending them back to their private doctor at least to ask the question. Right. But uh, uh, but if you do that kind of screening, it's you're pretty safe. It's an amazingly safe drug that way. Right. Uh, probably... One of the biggest issues that academia would push and probably criticize the most, if you go to the university, you'll be evaluated for probably two months while they'll profile you in a pretty total way, which I can't say is bad in itself. Right. We all want that kind of information. I would say in general that when large pieces of time and money are involved, you're excluding a lot of patients from care. Um, I didn't get into my third criticism of IV usage, which involved money, where I get into talking about money. But it does fit in there, and it kind of segues into this last uh, piece of filter that I that I'll mention. But when we're talking, IVs, 
people that do it IV usually charge more. And I think it's partly that you have this hood ornament of medical procedure to offer. Once you've done the IV, you're in a different situation and probably opting to entertain the operating room type of experience and concern, which is much more than the actual ketamine experience requires. So if you're giving it IV, though, you still have a taste of that operating room uh, extra concern, extra risk involved. Whereas when it's IM, you don't have that. Right. So the money part of it, though, is a whole separate thing from the medicine. Right. So Starbucks, Schultz, quoted the Federal Reserve as saying that half of America can't get together $400, which is a pretty amazing statement all by itself. But when we apply it to this world, it means that I'm all there is for half of America. So what you're saying is that no, that peop, uh, affordability rates is what we're right. talking about. People so can't that, like spend 400 bucks uh, without right. being impacted. Right. So half of America can't even consider it. I'm all there is. And we are talking about that filter and being able to reach them. Um, if I take uh, the price of the most expensive guys in town, $1,200 a dose, compare it to mine, take the figure of 80 million people and do a little math, I can make the statement that for every dollar uh, of price increased over my $300, you deny 100,000 Americans access to ketamine. That's what's really going on. You know, no one can afford it. So those 80 million uh, just can't be reached with this. Right. And... Um and we're going to get back to uh, you know what happens after you do the medical screening and, and on, but let's let's just segue really briefly uh, about ketamine not being is it or is it not um, covered by insurance? And if it is, uh, and if it isn't, why? If it is, great, uh, I guess it hasn't been covered by insurance except for esketamine, spravato. And what is es esketamine? Oh, esketamine is. I would say, first of all, it's an expression of Big Pharma's frustration at sitting there watching ketamine being an available antidepressant that they can't utilize for 15 years. So they've figured out a way to make this acceptable. So Spravato is basically the same chemical that I'm using. It is ketamine. Uh, but it's only half of my ketamine. Uh, most molecules come in right and left-handed versions. Uh, my ketamine, the one I'm using, the stuff we get in the bottle, has both sides. S-ketamine is my ketamine with the R-ketamine taken out of it. So it's basically the same molecule. Uh, but they've been able to get a patent on it. Not because it's a new molecule. They couldn't do that. That's illegal. Uh, you, you, know, you just can't patent the same thing twice. So they've gotten a patent on the nasal application of ketamine. And so they give it. And it works. But it's at a very much lower rate because you don't absorb that much of it. And I give the nasal spray away basically for free. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in that I use it mostly to supplement the rest of my stuff to draw out the intervals and so forth. Now that's changed some with the trochee people. We have pure trochee people there, so they're a whole different thing. Okay. So but, so that and that is covered by insurance? Spravato is. How come something like three thousand a dose? How Right. Three thousand mm -hmm. dollars a dose? Yeah, something like that, or three thousand a month. Okay, I'm not sure which, which extreme of money it is, but yeah, it's giant. Wow. So let me get this straight: ketamine, which which has higher efficacy 
is not covered by insurance. Right. And this modified molecule that, that was created is covered. It's not even a modified molecule. <laughs> it's just this separated theme. So the, the strength of that patent rests upon the power of the New York law firm that backs it. I spoke with a, a patent attorney, and he said it cost me 250000 to break their patent. It might be worth it. Which probably means a million. Uh, yeah, if, if you were one of the big medical centers here, right, it, uh, it might be worth it to challenge it. But to get the same drug, all you have to do is go to a compounding pharmacy and pay your $100. I mean, the price is one fiftieth. I'm not sure what it is, what the math, but it's hugely less. But this bravado is covered by insurance. So if you have the insurance and qualify, it's not going to cost the individual patient all that. The insurance is going to go up eventually for everyone. Right. So what, but, why are the insurance companies covering this drug that's, say, $3,000 compared to yours that's 300. It well, doesn't make sense from an insurance standpoint, right? That they would go with the, the less expensive They're starting to. One. Select Health, I heard, haven't seen it formally, but they announced that they're going to cover insurance. I've heard that Blue Cross has to a certain extent, but I, I don't know anything more about it. But uh, Select Health said that they would cover uh, IV and IM with pre-authorization and nasal spray and trochees without it. But that's just the verbal thing. But they will eventually, you bet. They don't want to be paying all, these mo all this money. But to start doing that, Big Pharma's going to howl. All that money, right, from the SSRIs that they aren't going to get. Because for every one of those... You're going to get the SSRIs being cut back. And both the doctor and Big Pharma are making a lot of money on it. You know, the, the, the big picture, I think, is that ketamine is too far along to be stopping it. People know it works. And so the market is going to speak eventually. People it should. Will just choose, people will choose it should choose get it. out there. And right. when the market speaks... Psychiatry is going to have to give up a third or a half of their medicines. You know, and in, in uh, the October issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, they asked, there was an article that asked what was the problem with psychiatry's identity crisis. And in that, they mentioned that psychiatry is hurting people more than it's helping them that they've been waiting for the science of neuroscience to save them for 70 years. And they really haven't been keeping up doing all the practical, touchy-feely things that mental health people ought to be doing, right? So that they make the comment that they're actually less able to supply the science of psychiatry to their patients now than they were 70 years ago. Less able. That is a wild statement. That is a wild right. statement. They, yeah, the, it, effectively, SSRIs are only said to work in the most extreme patients. So mild and moderate probably shouldn't be treated at all with them. Right, so it would make sense to start with ketamine treatment first. And then, if, and then if things still don't work for that remainder, those are the options that are still left on the table. Right. So do you think that's going to happen? Well, eventually, and it depends upon the doctor. Every doctor that knows what's going on, it's kind of tough to give out those medicines. And I think that the kids going bad are going to make a big difference. Now that we have an identified Pied Piper of sorts, you know, is anyone going to allow their kids to be given SSRIs if they know that ketamine, with its safety and likelihood of working, is available? Right.
Right. You know, I so mean, that, go, that goes back to the market just peaking and basically yeah, that should people be will vote huge. with their money. The kids aren't. I mean, once the kids learn what's going on. Right. Right. But uh, so let's, yeah, it's, a, it's a scary looking thing right, right. now. Right? So let, let's go back. Um, let's go back to uh, um, to your office virtually. Right. And so you screened a, a patient. They're phys- physically uh, um, a good candidate for this treatment. What happens next? Well, um, once they're screened and they've read through the consent form, which describes what psychedelia is and prepares them for it, then uh, they'll probably get some urine screening also just to, again, continue to profile the patient. And once they're physically okayed for it, and we assure ourselves that they haven't eaten in four hours and all those little requirements, Right. then we take them back to a room, and they'll plop down on a love sack, get comfortable. I love those. Uh, we have a special <laughs> monitoring device called a caretaker that measures the blood pressure and pulse with every beat from the digital artery of of your middle finger and uh, monitors all of that so we have a pretty good handle on on your vital signs Uh, then we'll calculate a dose uh, and administer it is that going to be based on the body mass um, the dose or yeah it's that Mm -hmm. That same formula, that 0.5 milligrams per kilogram, that caters the drug to you specifically. Right. And then ketamine is administered. What happens next? And then you sit and wait and see what happens excitedly. Uh, And uh, the experience then that I would describe is you have two to three minutes after the injection where you don't have any experience at all as the medicine diffuses through your muscle. Then as soon as it gets to your bloodstream, you start to experience it because it does cross the brain, the blood-brain barrier. And then it's a bell-shaped curve where you slowly or, or you rapidly increase on volume and peak out at 18 minutes and then slowly decrease in a reverse mode down to where you're ready to get another dose in 30 minutes. So how long are the sessions, like let's say day one, day three, day five? Yeah. So each day we give two injections. So you would do two half-hour injections, and you'd have another probably 15 minutes to a half an hour of recovery. The preceding time, if everything is streamlined, could be as little as 15 minutes if it's a repeat session. So that whole thing could be done in just under two hours. Amazing. Now, when people have those multiple legs I was talking about, remember, if you have four or five legs that you've built up for, then you're there uh, a much longer period of time. Like, I do have people with that get as many as six legs inside of one booster. So that's three hours plus whatever the recovery time is. Are you with them in, in the room when that happens or assisting someone is oh, with that person? We're checking on them. Right. They will generally have a chaperone. We also have... Uh, cameras on them that communicate with a large 75-inch 4K screen where we get to watch all the patients up on the screen for the nurse practitioner that's sitting in in a different room. We also have a a big 4K screen where all their vital signs are that come off of this caretaker. Right. So we can sit in another room and be watching and them constantly monitor. and the vital signs. Right. But we oftentimes, in fact, usually have someone in the same room there too. Right. And then afterwards, uh, and they recover. I, get, I assume they can't drive. 
well, we should have, you know, we should discuss going to the bathroom here. Right. So <laughs> if you're there for three hours, undoubtedly your bladder is going to find a filling and you're going to have to be getting to the bathroom. So we ask you to wait until you're down. But when you're confused and psychedelicized, we oftentimes aren't thinking straight. That's what the chaperone's all about. So you will probably be wheelchaired to the bathroom, accompanied into the bathroom, finish the chores, and come back again. And that's, that's one of the big issues is watching that particular thing. Here's, here's an odd question for you. Do patients have eyes open, closed? Do they listen to music? How are they during the, you know, um, when the drug is working? How oh, music is great. I like natural environments, you know, uh, we, we have a clinic where we look out onto a forest view and it's real natural and, and it's as close to, I can really offer to what we can offer because we've got to keep you indoors for the most part. Uh, I'd like to have you on the beach watching waves breaking. That'd be the perfect, you know, any psychedelia that, should be in a natural that's your second situation. Yeah. That's, your se that's your second clinic. Exactly. <laughs> what you don't want is to be in a formal, structured office. Why is that? Yeah, so talk about that. You mentioned the love stack, so uh, that's totally different than what I would have imagined, you know, a typical doctor's office. So uh, what, is exactly. your, what does your office look like? Well, let me start with every hippie knows that you don't go in to a supermarket stoned. You just don't like that structure. It, you know, if it's human made and uh, has that rigidity to it that the psychedelicized mind recognizes, they get uncomfortable, just don't like it. In a doctor's office, smelling of alcohol and all the stainless steel, uh, it's kind of like a supermarket there. It's pretty similar, you know. M many patients don't like it. Now, that's not everyone. Some people will definitely choose that and find the casualness of my clinic um, off-putting, you know. And I have dogs there, too. I have petting dogs, yeah, right, that are ro roaming, around roaming around the place. And they really fit into the atmosphere, and many patients find comfort petting that dog, both from their depression and the psychedelia. Well, I hope you pay them well and good treats. They are paid enormously <laughs> well. They're, they are very happy dogs. They get so many people they get to minister to. When I had Zappy over here last week on, on this podcast, he mentioned uh, this in the context of psychedelics, so other you know um, plant medicines that are illegal at, at this point in, in, in the U.S., but he mentioned set and setting. So that seems that that's kind of like what you're... Uh, that's what's what happening. we're talking about. Right. Yeah, yeah. That, that term was invented uh, uh, back in the 70s. I think it was Timothy Leary himself that came up with that one. But yeah, the set is the set of your mind that you bring to it. And the setting is your immediate surroundings. So in the clinic, uh, our manipulation of the setting has to do with the love sacks, carpeted floors, artwork, stuff like that. And the set is what we want you to bring right, uh, to the place. So we're trying to settle down your brain. Right. But... Are you, are you coaching? That's not something that we can really jump in there too much, except that altering the setting obviously influences. Influences right, your mind, yeah, your mindset. Um, do you recommend something for people to how to change their set, how, how to change their mindset? Um, well, you mentioned music already. Right. I sure like music. Uh, some people like to put on ear pads and cover their eyes. Uh, I think music is just wonderful and when anyone asks me about which music is best i uh, usually uh, remind them that ketamine was invented 
in almost the same year as Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So how can I not point to the Beatles? And the Beatles are good. But Pink Floyd is another one that folks tend to gravitate to. But mostly the music of your choice. And I like the modern beat stuff that people fashion just for meditating and so forth too all that stuff works so you recommend people do some meditation and quiet their mind and well or doesn't matter oh you know i i really think that enhancing the the effects of ketamine is really consistent with most of the buddhist stuff right where uh, mindfulness meditation that's really what it's all about uh for the most part as far as mind control and getting in there and ketamine offers a huge opportunity for that now if you're depressed you're not going to be very good at meditating anyway uh you may be able to do it but uh you need your dopamine your serotonin and your gaba as rewards we we, we get that for everything whether it's walking across the room or whether it's meditating proper, when you're meditating, trying to release things and do all that stuff, uh, having a normal brain really helps, and ketamine can restore that normal brain so you can get on a proper pathway. Depression is such a thing of diversion. It's taking you f from the health. So it's a bunch of steps to get back to the normal pathway. Having that, uh, those neurotransmitters there makes that return so much easier. After coming back and after this treatment, um, every other day or however the protocol dictates depending on each individual patient, is this something that has to be perpetually done? Do you find people can go through this treatment and be freed from, from depression or do they need boosters every year? How, how long, like some of your patients, you know, for how many years, how long did it, is it like every year? Is that like, is that, is that like your annual thing that then you have to do? What are some of those stories that you have on that? In general, we usually think of depression as being a thing of forever. Once that black snake of your lateral habenular burst mode has emerged, it's not going back again. But um, that having been said, you can at least take giant steps towards being healthy again. To, to understand what's going on, I like to uh, do a little metaphor on the lateral habenula. So, if I put a windshield on it, and if I call stress mud, then I can say that ketamine can clean your windshield in almost all situations. It'll get it clean. But if you have a whole lot of mud, it's not going to last that long. Right. So bipolarity, OCD, pain-based, autism, those are all mental states that are just loaded with stress. You know, they're, they have constant stress just because of whatever wiring that's going on there. So with all that native stress, they're never going to be freed of their mud, of their stress, enough to be called normal. Right. Or even to be able to qualify for the Holy Grail. I, I like that analogy. It's kind of like expecting that you take your car to the car wash and then you expect it to be clean forever. Right. You know, there's always the environment, the elements that will be, you know, affecting it. So you're going to have to clean it eventually. So. so if you aren't one of those genetically defined uh, foci of depression or whatever... Uh, if you're a normal person that's just gone bad because you've become a part of society, you followed the soap operas, you have all the attachments and aversions that every American has, uh, if you're that person, uh, if you can free yourself 
of those attachments and aversions. Right. And ketamine and psychedelics do a little bit of that normally, right? Everyone has a different set of values. When they come back, they have different perspectives on those old things that they once revered. So, um, yeah, just different focuses on sex, money, everything. And it probably... The common truth to all of it is something that parallels that Buddhist guy in a cave, you know, that has learned to find peace inside himself, that's learned how to truly appreciate the role of gratitude and all that. You know, you aren't out there searching as much. It's all right here and now. Zappy... um um, in my conversation with him said that going inwards is where you're going to be able to do more fixing than, than, than outwards. And I like, I like what you're saying, and, and, and let me just say why, because this is not just a magic pill that will fix all of your problems, but it is a tool that can take you away from such distress that you can at least see the problems that you have and then employ other tools or try to rethink your life and, um, and restructure it so that you may not need to go back to, to the treatment. And in certain, if it's, the load is so heavy, then you, you may need to, but at least it gives you an option of revisiting and seeing, hey, here's all the problems that I've had versus if you're just right inside of the, the, exactly, right. the, the, um, the, the eye of the storm, then you I don't even agree. know. Totally, right. I like that. I like that. That's that's um, that is very truthful. A because like if you would just say like oh no this is just a magic pill then obviously that would be just unrealistic because life can always stress you out again. You can always be exposed to new things that will impact you. The Buddha was still on the path, wasn't he? Right. right. So it gets you on the path, and once you're on the path to self improvement, then there's always opportunity. Right. Who doesn't have opportunity for self-improvement? And if that's what you value, you know, that's what it's all about. And ketamine can give you that, and it gives you the dopamine to want to go after it. Let's switch topic uh, to go, going back to PTSD and helping veterans and your involvement in Ketamine Fund. So Zappi and Warren, and for those who haven't seen um, um, the the podcast that we recorded with Zappi, uh, we go into a little bit more about Ketamine Fund. Um, but um, Dr. Hemstra was was uh, was at the um, at the event when they were talking about the significance of ketamine being used to to save lives, save people from from suicidal ideation. We talked about depression, but suicide is a whole new level, right? You're depressed, you're in it. Suicide, you're, you're ready to pull the plug, right? I know you've, because you've, you've mentioned some of the experiences that you've had, but would you mind sharing some of the success stories that you've had on that account? People that were close to, uh, um, you know, committing suicide and went through the treatment. Well, it's a common story. Uh, you know, one of the probably most amazing things about this job is that you have patients in such extremity of gratitude. I, I mean, I did 40 years of emergency room, and there's only a handful of patients that were as filled with gratitude as 60 or 70 percent of the ketamine patients. So that's huge. It's just, it's almost a routine story and that's the glory of it is that it's so routine but uh just a few days ago auric uh the office manager had uh brought in one of the vets that told him a story he'd had one ketamine treatment and had a partial response but then got depressed again and that morning he had decided he had made the decision well Let's see, which way, way shall I go? Into the clinic, or should I blow my brains out? And that was his decision. I'm telling you the story because he came to the clinic. 
and routine story. You know, when we talk about suicide, though, I like to go to the big picture right now. What is it? Well, there's 120 people dying a day from opiates. Fentanyl and... Uh, what? Fentanyl yeah, and... All the different well, opiates, heroin, heroin, the whole thing that we lay on opiates and was majorly exacerbated by uh, uh, by Purdue Pharmacy and just pushing opiates forever, right? But there's still 120 people dying a day, even though ketamine could save those people too. Uh, ketamine with alcohol, I describe as being kind of oil and water. If you like give, alcohol addiction, if you give well, just the alcohol. If you give ketamine during the alcohol, we know from studies it literally washes the synapses clean right away. So it'll help alcohol, but only after you've stopped it. Okay. Right? Treating an active alcoholic just doesn't work that well. Whereas with opiates, I call that hand and glove. Opiate has some physiologic relationship with opiates where um, I can reduce a heroin addict's withdrawal symptoms to zero with an antidepressant dose. Which, uh, and considering that an, an opiate addict is an addict driven primarily by his depression. So if I can treat the opiate and the baseline depression that's causing it, wow, I should have huge success there. But no one's even looking at it. And the reason I think is that the only approach that we're taking towards opiate addiction is through the pain clinics and all these opiate type medicines, Suboxone, Naltrexone. We, ketamine doesn't have a role there, a formal medical role, that it should. And it doesn't, I think, because Big Pharma won't let it in the door again because it is still threatening all of the SSRIs. You say, well, but it's not SSRIs that we're really addressing there. Uh, but it is. It's the depression. It's the depression that is there. And if they demand that the SSRIs be, be given, the depression has to be preserved to, in a strange way. But so uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the opiates, what should happen is that those pain clinics should... Uh, First, treat the patient with the opiates, and that's important because if I go right to an opiate addict with the ketamine, if he's taking a large dose, I, re I return him to virgin status with respect to his opiates so that I remove his tolerance. So if I treat him and he goes out and has the same dose of opiates, he could theoretically overdose as they do all the time. So you have to have this tapering and all. And there has to be a relationship. I'm trying to develop a relationship with a few uh, rehab places now. But the rehab places are having a really hard time staying alive because they all cost so much. And they don't really understand this relationship with the opiates and the ketamine. But there's huge potential there. And we are trying to work it out and if we can get this thing going, uh, eventually we will. And ketamine could play a huge role with all of them. So I got two questions for you. One of them is, where do you see this in a couple of years, one or, or five, uh, ketamine in, in general? And two, uh, speaking of the ketamine fund, which is, which is uh, trying to get funding for uh, ketamine treatments for, PTSD, for veterans with PTSD, um, what what would you like to tell veterans who are struggling with with these uh, suicide ideation um, to I don't know illuminate them in terms of why should they try ketamine other than the fact that it's so successful obviously and free 
I and mean, free through the Academy With that Fund. combination, should I have to say anything? Right. Right? I mean, it should be an information only, right? It should be first step. Yeah. If you're depressed, you come into the clinic, we'll treat you for free. Wow. Uh, pretty simple on that, huh? Done. Uh, so it's mostly reaching people. I'm amazed that more people don't know about ketamine. Right. Uh, and increasingly, I should become more and more surprised that they don't know about the fund and haven't taken advantage of it. Right. Why not? Well, first of all, any depressed person is kind of what walking in honey uh, in the sense that uh, to motivate depression is tough. You know, they may hear about something, but to actually get them to change directions and head to a clinic, uh, that's just a surprisingly difficult thing in itself. Right. Friends ought to play huge roles there and right. recognize things and get them in. Uh, and I'm just guessing at this. I don't know why people... Are. I'm amazed every day that I don't come to work and find two miles of patients lined up outside my door. Why aren't they out there, right? I mean, we're talking enough, and this is the apex product of most of these people's existence, right? This is the only way they're going to be happy in their life is to somehow find their way to ketamine. And that's just the truth that we can see now. Now, there's a few other exotic places like the university has a propofol study where if you'll be put out like Michael Jackson was 10 times, you get huge relief from your depression. It's probably true. It's also hugely dangerous. The price has got to be astronomical and therefore out of reach of almost everyone in America. Right. Which means ketamine is just it. I asked the question at the end of one article that I wrote, if ketamine were available to every person in America, wouldn't this be a whole lot better place? And I would assert hugely that, who knows, maybe, maybe that's the only way to get back to the 60s. And I say that because the 60s was a relatively undepressed times, little anxiety. They were very happy times. Right, because they were high all the time. <laughs> oh, uh, <laughs> I think the rest of the people were happy too. I think the capitalists, right? Capitalism was pure. There wasn't any equity. Everyone was on an equal financial basis. I think that's far more important than, than the drugs that were available. Right. Uh, sure they were, but uh, you know we had different times. And of course, we were all heroes after winning World War II. In terms of, um, so one of the things that we're going to do on this podcast over here on this show is um, I'm inviting um, veterans who went through the treatment. I'm looking for veterans who hopefully will hear these uh, stories, these accounts of, of veterans going through this um, and sharing their stories. And hopefully those stories will... Um, Give them a sense of through kind of connection through camaraderie, they will they will see that this is this is one of the um, um, ways to to address their issues. So we're going to be doing that. I'm hoping to already have several different uh, veterans who who went through this, and and of course you know all of them. <laughs> and there's but there's additional ones. But also I want to I want this message to spread so that those who don't know about this will hear this through either YouTube or whatever whatever the platforms we're going to be reaching out uh, uh, this with, so they can hear these stories and then they can um, take advantage of the ketamine fund and then find you here east coast um i know there's another doctor on east coast in new york who's who's a, a very uh, very much in in this as well in this space but that's going to be that that part that we're uh, we're we want to do over here to kind of spread the message and 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 have people right. like uh get into this so let's talk about like what you think is going to happen in a year and five like where is this going where you know what, what do you think can happen with this well 
What are you it's hoping to happen? It's tough not to be optimistic, isn't it? Right. I mean, we're starting off. We're doing great. It's taken a long time. As I said, I'm still surprised there aren't two miles of line outside my office. But more and more are finding it out. More and more people know about it. Uh, the academic resistance is not getting less. I think th there is uh, some big moment that's about to happen in that world because there's big changes. What kind of changes? Well, all those SSRIs are pretty worthless. They have to be demoted, I would say. And are they going to take that standing down? Or, uh, or I just don't think they are. What is going to happen with that? But it's pretty much got to happen. Could they resist it and just tough it out and suppress ketamine somehow? Um, I kind of doubt it. Will they embrace it? I would think uh, they ought to try embracing it. But there's a huge complexity of different forces up there. Big Pharma rules the place. There's, they have so much money there. Are they going to say yes to all these people getting ketamine and, and their SSRIs stopped? I just don't see how that's going to happen. Right. And there is a lot of anger up there. So there's going to be some moment when the conversation reaches some big time and they yield. I mean, basically applying that new rules where SSRIs will not be allowed before the ketamine has been tried. Right. Are we going to get there? Uh, or when are we going to get there? I would, I would think it's a when issue, and I would hope that it would be in three or four years. Um, one thing that Zappi mentioned in, in, uh, in, in the episode that we recorded was something that makes me hopeful about this because he said there's one more group that's as powerful as, 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 pharma, uh, as, as Big Pharma, and that's insurance companies. And if they will do the ROI calculation or the you know mathematical cal cal calculation on, on what's more profitable for them, should we shell out this amount of money for these uh, drugs that are less effective that we'll, we'll have to pay even more out versus this treatment, which is going to be more cost effective? You know that cost analysis, ben, uh, um, cost, uh, yeah, co benefits, cost and benefits analysis. If they do that, that's the hope that they will realize. You know what? We should make this uh, covered and go uh, through ketamine instead of all these other things that are just less efficient, uh, effective. Um, so that's that's the big hope um, in that realization on their part. I would sure think so, but uh, it's still. I know it's very complex. It's still, even well, behind the, the insurance companies are going to have to take a little bit of a hit there too. Mm, right. Right. I mean, they're taking a cut out of the SSRIs that are being administered, they have to stay alive. That's what they are. And ketamine just doesn't have as much. But it's going to creep in there. I can't imagine that it's not, right? Especially if people really start bringing to their doctor and asking the question, why are you giving right. me this medicine? So it seems like it's just a basically awareness campaign is what has to happen so that people get educated and hopefully those who are listening to podcasts like th like like these like this one um, will get informed about it and and start asking their doctors. And, Pretty much, yeah. though, depressed minds aren't too interested in the words that are floating right. one room away. Right. So how do you reach those people? Well, hopefully, they and it's not community. intellectual stuff like this. It's mostly uh, getting the depressed people that they know to talk to them. It, you know, and again, I, I think one of the biggest things uh, potentially happening is the creation of a depressed society uh, that's been relieved of their depression by the ketamine. Uh, I would love to see a 70,000 strong ketamine co-op where I only charged $100 a patient or a dose, right? And I think that's possible, partly because that community would take care of itself 
recognize what was going on and um, accept that they've got to care for their own people, have a responsibility, and uh, just go at it that way, which would be a whole different thing. And if that happened, and those people know each other, you know, a depressed person can only really relate to another depressed person because they aren't understood by folks who haven't gone through the experience. Do you think ketamine can be used as a diagnostic tool in a sense of, am I depressed? I've already been there. I'm already making that assertion. And yes, Big Pharma is going to hate that when I lay it on them. But remember, I already made the statement that you need to fail two SSRIs before ketamine. Well, it's is that a only, law, or what? is that a law, or just a rule? Oh, that's Doctor Bob's rule number one. Okay. Okay, it's only from here, right? But anyone that's in the ketamine world would would recognize that. But the next step is with, with a drug that is seventy to eighty-five percent as effective as it is that's as safe as it is where it's so difficult to hurt someone physically with it. You know, we give it to every soldier that's getting morphine to cut down on the opiates. We give it to six-year-olds to sew up their owies. If one of those went bad, the whole thing would change. Right. right. So um, I would assert that this is a valid test for depression. If you get better on ketamine, you are depressed. Now, it doesn't discriminate between bipolar, OCD, autistic, regular modes of depression, but they're all depressed. They're all by way of the lateral habenula. Those are all, you know, PTSD ends up causing stress and and, and the depression by way of the lateral habenula. So they all have that common pathway. Uh, and ketamine treats them all. That's magic. And I, I haven't sat in front of a psychiatrist and laid this rule on him yet, but I will soon. And it'll be interesting to see what he says. I don't think he can argue against it. It's going to be interesting to see if one day this is going to be like step one in terms of just testing whether you are depressed or not and, and then taking it from, from there. Yeah. So. Yeah. What if we give you a ketamine trochee the night before and if you wake up happy, then you were depressed. You were depressed. Right. And it might be that simple. Uh, and we do it every day in the clinic. But we already know they're depressed, right? They come in with that diagnosis. But, you know, the university will spend two months making that diagnosis. And is it an accurate diagnosis? Well, if you read the Wired magazine article about the discussion between the editors of DSM-5 uh, sitting or facing against the editors of DSM-3 and 4, Right. Where the editors said, hey, editor of, of uh, DSM-5, you are not a neuroscience, no matter how hard you, you, you say that fact. It is not a valid one. And these guys, I mean, they were swearing. I mean, in the article, it's an academic article, and they're using all these swear words, talking about how psy psychiatrists don't really understand the fundamentals of disease because they can't. Our uh, port, uh, portrayals of disease entities don't correlate to the biology of it. And, right? and, for, and for those who don't know, DSM-5 and 4 and 3 are basically uh, um, Bibles, I guess, so to speak, for uh, the psychologically, so. psychological community and mental health uh, community. They define, they define the nature of mental health disease. Right. Right. And they don't agree. Right. right. That's true. That is true. I've, I've so heard. considering that, the university spends two month, months doing all this analysis, but actually their analysis is to try to figure out 
which SSRI they should be given because they all have subtle differences. If it doesn't really make that much of a difference, I mean, it, it, it might, you know, Prozac is different from a few others. Uh, there's certain types that'll do it. But once you've given one or two of them, you've created this mental state that I like to call a shrink wrap twilight zone that is unique to that person in history. You've created a brain state that no one understands. So the therapist has got to be in there trying to figure it out with every new brain state, right? And they spend time at that, and then they try to give a particular SSRI. Um, I don't think anyone thinks that's really a very valid therapeutic approach. You know, even inside that world, they recognize the problems with it. If there would be one message that you could just tell the whole world, what would it be? Well, ketamine's price is inversely proportional to its effectiveness. There is no depressed person that doesn't want ketamine at the moment, whether he knows it or not. And it's just that valid a medicine. It's really key in this world where depression and anxiety are taking us over like they never have before. And the kids are where I look to see the greatest amount of concern. If they're all going bad, I think the only tool that I would want on my team would be ketamine. And that's, that's probably the big deal there. And I don't think anyone can really argue effectively against that point. How young of a patient can, can, uh, um, can be admitted and to, uh, to, to do this treatment? How young can someone come in? Well, uh, people don't really know. When we look at studies where we look at concerns with development and all, uh, in mice, we see that it's mostly embryologic that we can see concern. We don't see that much at age four or five, uh, but would we want to give it at that age? Well, at certain times, uh, there would be a reason for it. Uh, but probably the absolute cutoff would be one or two. And then after that, I wouldn't do it personally without pediatricians right. and doctors involved and all. Right. But theoretically, I could understand some other doctor uh, giving a young child ketamine under some particular situation. I wouldn't be very concerned about the negatives at age seven or eight. I'd still uh, want the kids' doctors involved in, in the decision-making. But once they get up to around 10, I don't think I'd be too awfully concerned about it. Uh, and I've treated a few younger kids that way. Oh, and I should mention, too, we'll just throw this out, that uh, of those younger kids, most of them were autistic, that there's a special thing that happens uh, with autism. Actually, more with this new heating device that we have called an Avacin. It's a microcirculation heating thing that uh, distributes the heat throughout your smaller circulation all over your body. And in uh, autistic kids, a fever can return their thinking to relative normalcy, or at least a major step towards it. Now, ketamine also works with autistic kids. How, how so? Uh, it just, parents relate that their moods change. They interpret whatever is going on as being positive, right, when we give it to them. That's a and, whole other episode. And I have no idea what's going on with it. Right. But those two things, you know, you can give them an artificial fever and they think better. Would that... Uh, or help giving ketamine at the same time? 
Um, ketamine does help all by itself put the two together. Someone's got to ask that question, and it's pretty exciting. So more to be researched in that domain, well, it's, but it's very interesting observations. Yeah. What ketamine is doing, we really don't understand that well yet. You know, we, we have huge insights, but the brain is so complex. Right. Uh, we, we don't understand the mechanism of how it works. The, the article that I quoted from Nature magazine probably gives the best portrait of what's going on of anything that I've seen, but that's not really explaining too much about what it does. It's an NMDA blocker, but that just means that it blocks glutamate. All these other effects, uh, dendritic repair, even the lateral habenular burst mode. How is that affected from that receptor? You know, we don't understand stuff like that yet. Well, what's really um, what's really encouraging is the statistics that you bring to the table. And as you're still collecting your data and everything, but the sheer number of patients that you treated and the effectiveness of this uh, therapy is is just speaks for itself. So that is very encouraging, and and I hope that with propagation of the awareness about this treatment and um, and the cases that we're going to bring in, the stories of veterans and, and other people affected positively by, by ketamine can, can shine the light more on this. Is there anything else that you want to share before we close down? You know, really just um, a continuation of that. Getting the word out is ketamine's big plus. Anyone that knows about it has to take advantage of it if they realize that they have that condition. Uh, how often ketamine is going to be utilized, what the percentage of the population that will have known it in 10 years, I really don't know, but it's, I would hope, and I think it probably will be, pretty huge. And I think the world's going to be a different place for it. Well, I sure hope so. Um, I'm really optimistic after hearing some of the stories and you uh, explaining some of the things that were still kind of vague uh, to me. I have, I think, better understanding, and I hope that whoever watches this uh, this podcast is going to get all the insights that we talked about over here and, and will make their decision to uh, to see if this is an appropriate treatment for them. And and if they know someone who is in a need of, of a um, treatment, giving them an option, at least illuminating that as a, as a possibility to, uh, to explore. What a gift. Yeah. All right. On that note, we're going to end. Thank you so much, doctor. And thank you. And, um, and we're going to bring in some, uh, we're going to bring in some uh, other guests who will talk about how ketamine changed their lives. I'm sure many vets will be treated as a result of what you're doing. Thank you. The world is full of interesting people with wisdom and extraordinary experiences to learn from. Join me on a journey to discover them, speak with them, and learn from them. I'm Adrian Sinclair, host of A Podcast with Interesting People at apodcast.com. 